Hi, this is Rabbi Jeff Sachs of Atid and Rebbe Shiva uh, with uh, another installment of our series on Rabbi Salvatrix's Halachic Man. Our series is sponsored in memory of Rabbi Ezra Labaton, Sephardah Labracha, by Michael and Tiffany Beda. Um, I'm sure, like most of you, certainly those of you that are listening uh, live or within close proximity to when this is recorded, um, you know, my thoughts are very far away. Uh, I came back uh, having been this afternoon at the funerals um, uh, for uh, for the three boys, um, and uh, it's you know all we can all we can do to think about anything else uh, when our minds are there with them and their families, and it's not how we had hoped it was all going to turn out. Um, the nature of living in Israel, of course, is is that it's uh, like we say about Yerushalayim. By extension, it applies to the whole country. Ir We're all connected in a different web of connectedness here that you don't have elsewhere. Two and a half weeks ago, on that awful Friday, when we heard that these three boys had been kidnapped and not very far from where we live um, before they even released the names, I I said to myself, there's no chance that we don't know at least one of the families. Uh, and everyone can feel that. And, you know, certainly everyone can certainly feel minimally there's only ever one degree of separation if you don't know one of the families, so then you know someone who does. And of course, we did, we do. The Frankel family, uh, the mother in the family, Racheli Frankel, Racheli Sprecher Frankel, who's a rather well known Mechanechet, Melamedet, in Yerushalayim, a teacher of Torah, was once upon a time a chavrus of my wife when they learned in Bravinder's, in Rabbi Bravinder's uh, Midrasha, way back, uh, way back when. At the funeral this afternoon, uh, in No Fai Alone, in Shalvim, in their community, uh, she mentioned the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah that says, Yofet Sa'aka Lefnei Gzar Hadin V'yofet Adam Atsaka Lachar Gzar Hadin that prayer and calling out and crying out to God is good, is beneficial, both before the decree and after the decree. And she made the point of saying that all of our tefillot these past two and a half weeks uh, and all of the acts of kindness and all of the acts of, of unity that we've seen both in Israel and throughout the Jewish world, even though they didn't produce the intended result. Because after all, you know, God is not at our beck and call. Uh, in, in her words, he's not, we're not his boss, he's ours. Uh, but even though all of those good things did not have the desired result, they're still yafe, they're still good. They're, they are in and of themselves a good. And even an unanswered prayer is a valuable prayer because if it doesn't change the result, perhaps it changes us as individuals and as, as a people. And that was one of the things that I, I took away from the experience of of, uh, of being at the funeral this afternoon. Let's turn our attention now to Halachic Man, hard as that is to do. We're here in chapter 10. Let me skip ahead. We're on, in chapter 10 on page 60, 63. Oops, here. Part 1, chapter 10. Uh, after the discussion that we had previously about Simsum, uh, here, halachic man, halachic man's relationship to existence is not only ontological, but also normative in nature. Meaning, it's not just abstract. The discussion of how halachic man relates to reality is principally through the normative understanding. By normative, we're talking about 
a set of norms, a set of regulations, or in the parlance of the work, the halakha. Now remember, I've mentioned a few times, halakha is used interchangeably both in this work and throughout Rabbi Soloveitchik's writings in two different meanings. I've sometimes nicknamed them halakha with a capital H and halakha with a lowercase h. Halakha with a lowercase h is the, the more general notion. If I forgot to say, Yavo on Rosh Chodesh, what is the halakha? Meaning, what is the normative rule? What do I have to do? Is this food kosher, or is it not kosher? That's the, a normative halakhic question. By norm, we mean not, not what's normal, don't be confused with normal, but, but a sense of the norm, the, the, what's required of us. And then there's halakha with a capital H. And that is the kind of overall, overarching system, both as a legal system, but also as a kind of philosophical system which is the outgrowth of and reflection of the collective of the halakha, principally as embodied in the Torah Shabbat Peh, principally as embodied in the Gemara, uh, but in, in the entirety of, of rabbinic literature. And that's halakha as a kind of synonym for, well, for Jewish philosophy, depending upon how you define what Jewish philosophy is what Jewish philosophy is. So here, the, the, the normative understanding, uh, he goes on to say, in truth, the ontological approach serves as the vestibule whence he may, when he, the halachic man, may enter the banquet hall of normative understanding. That's a metaphor he's borrowing from Pirkei Avot, that this world is the, the entry hall, the lobby, the vestibule for the world to come, which is the, the banquet hall but that the ontological approach, the kind of abstract thought, becomes an entree for the meat and potatoes. I've mixed the metaphor, pardon me. Um, the appetizer for the, for the meat and potatoes, um, which is the halakha. But here we mean halakha in a kind of dialectic way, a balancing between halakha with a capital H and with a lowercase h. Or it's the way in which you really see that once you start to, to, um, uh, to unpack capital H halakha, the philosophical system, the world view, inside it's made up of actual dinim, actual sugyot in the Gemara, actual sifim in the Shulchan Aruch, which are the raw materials from which we build the larger, the larger system. Halachic man cognizes the world in order to subordinate it to a religious performances. And here he kind of re repeats an idea that he had repeated earlier, the degree to which halachic man looks at the real created physical world that we occupy as the, as the embodiment of a, of a halachic system. Or, you can look at the real world and from that, as it were, let's say, reverse engineer the halachic code. For instance, halachic man cognizes space by means of religious a priori lawful categories in order to realize it in the halachic, the norms of the Shabbat, the commandment of the sukkah, the idea of purity. He engages in the same type of calculations as do the astronomers. This is a comment the Rambam makes about Kiddush HaChodesh. That, that when we're determining the calendar, that the laws of determining the calendar, not our calendar, which is a kind of set fixed calendar, but in the days when the witnesses would see the new moon and they would go to the Bedin, they would go to Shalayim and they would testify and that would determine when Rosh Chodesh would be. And because of that, we never knew within a um, variable of any one day uh, when Rosh Chodesh would be and that would have a ramification for when the Yomim Tovim would come out because if Rosh Chodesh is today, then, then, uh, then Pesach is going to be in two weeks from today. But if, Pesach, if Rosh Chodesh is tomorrow, 
then Pesach will be two weeks from tomorrow. And, well, you know, that makes a difference after all, since you want to do Pesach right. And the same thing for the other holidays. And that's the, all the sugyot in, in Mesechet Rosh Hashanah, about how they would let people know when Rosh Chodesh had been, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, how the messages got out, and then the problems of the people that lived very far away, outside of the borders of Israel, and how they would never really be able to know in time when Rosh Chodesh had been declared in Jerusalem. So therefore, that's the origins of our idea of keeping two days of Yom Tov outside of Eretz Yisrael, out of, out of doubt. And even though today we no longer have that doubt, because after all, people in Israel can speak simultaneously to people in Chutzlaretz. You can even see me. You could even watch us right now through a platform like Web Yeshiva. Maybe Web Yeshiva will be the, will be the, uh, you know, the video conferencing platform for the Bet Din when Mashiach will come to Meher Rabbi Amin, and we will go back to having Kiddush HaChodesh al and people all over the world will be able to find out where and when things are. But we still maintain, uh, at least currently, we still maintain because of the power of Minhag, the power of custom, that outside of the land of Israel, people keep two days of of Yom Tov because of these ideas. The Rambam, this has been something on the side, the Rambam in his Hilchot Kiddush HaChodesh uh, mentions that in order to do all of this, the Chachamim needed to be astronomers. Remember to always carefully differentiate between astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is the study of the heavens and the celestial bodies. Astrology is a bunch of nonsense. Um, at least for the Maimonidean. Um, so when when you look at the stars, my my six year old just got as a present a a uh, a quality uh, toy telescope. Uh, meaning it's it's you know it's a real telescope. It's not the kind of thing that they probably use at the jet propulsion laboratories. But it's uh, you know it's it's made for a kid. But even you know with this even with this you know kitty you know, quality telescope, he's able to see things in the heavens that uh, the naked eye can't spot, and um, and it fills you with fills you with wonder. It fills you with with um, you know a, a sense of awe at creation. But that may maybe the halachic man experiences that, but that's not his principal reaction. The principal reaction of halachic man is to look at the natural world and to see superimposed upon it the halachic norm. And again, go, he's referring back to ideas he spoke at greater length, but go back to our discussion of halachic man as the architect or as the, the other metaphor that I used about the, the, the musical composer, about the ideal superimposed on reality. We spoke about that. Um, someone had mentioned the example of that woman uh, uh, who they made that documentary film about? What's her name? Uh, I'm forgetting. You know the one that works with the animals. And in the film, they do a very good job of showing like how she sees the world in a in a different way. And I use that as an example to uh, to demonstrate the way the halachic man looks at the world, superimposing, uh, superimposing. Um, yeah, Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin. Uh, so the movie that they made about her. Uh, does a very good job of like where they show you how the world appears to her, um, and uh, and how it appears different, and and how she views everything in this very kind of um, uh, mechanical way, and she can see things from some other perspective. Um, so I use that as a metaphor for you know kind of parallel way that um, that halachic man must see the world. Uh, he looks through the telescope and he sees something different. He sees the laws of Kedusha. He looks through the telescope and he sees the Rambam Silchos Kedusha Chodesh. He sees Masechet Rosh Hashanah. He studies the plant world for the purpose of clarifying the species, etc. And he gives all these examples which we've talked about uh, before. Thus, his normative doctrine has priority from a teleological perspective over his ontological approach. Cognition is for the purpose of doing. He looks at the world. He studies the world. And it is for the purpose of determining halacha lemaase. 
So again, you understand why I talk about the bridge between halacha with a capital H and with a lowercase h. Halacha l'ma'aseh, the actual normative law, is what we generally think of as the lowercase halacha. And then he mentions the very well-known Demar and Kedushin, the debate about limud and ma'aseh. The Gemara debates which is which is supreme, which which is the greater uh, or, or the more the more um, the more um, which, which is which is supreme study, which is a kind of abstract theoretical or maaseh action, which is the implementation of ideas, the actual fulfillment. So the Gemara concludes, G'dola limud ha-mevila de ma'aseh, a kind of typical Talmudic splitting of the hair, that study is great because study always includes study, limud, as well as ma'aseh. That the, since the purpose of study is the implementation of the halakha, the study leads to action. You're going to learn Masechet Sukkah all year long. When it's going to come time for Sukkot, not only are you going to actually want to sit in the Sukkah and actually shake the lulav, but your sitting and your shaking are going to be different. They're going to be better. They're going to be enhanced. Not just because you're going to get the details right. You know, that's, that's always the way it is. You know, you... You do mitzvot. Sometimes you do it for a very, very long time, and uh, and you know either because you're doing it out of out of rote performance or because you are um, you know or because you're you're acting on some kind of mistaken bit of knowledge. When you learn, you get it right. I. I Recently encountered a, a some family who were balei tshuva, um, uh, and uh, the, the husband told me. He said, "Yeah, when we started keeping, he said, we started keeping Shabbat. We kept Shabbat for the first time every Shabbat for you know years. Meaning, like every Shabbat they would keep Shabbat. Like the first Shabbat they decided they were going to keep Shabbat, they kept Shabbat. Except you know Shabbat's complicated." And there's all types of things you don't know. You know, like if no one ever told you you have to turn off the light in the refrigerator, like why would you assume somebody would figure that out on their own the first time they tried to keep Shabbat? Uh, you know, why would you assume somebody knows about the tearing Shabbat toilet paper before they're actually sitting in the restroom on that first Shabbat? Uh, there's all types of things you wouldn't kind of figure out intuitively on your own. Um, Maybe you know about Kiddush, maybe you know about Chala, maybe you know about uh, not starting fires, but, you know, so the first Shabbat, they kept Shabbat, and then they realized that all the things they had gotten wrong. So the next Shabbat, they kept Shabbat for the first time, and then they learned about all the things they'd gotten wrong, and this went on for week after week after week, you know, every week hoping that this will be the Shabbat that we all get it, that we all get it right. So when you learn, so it helps you, it helps you get it, get it right. Um... Even recently, uh, when my eldest son became bar mitzvah a, a number of years ago, we were learning Hilchot Tzfilin together, which is something you do before, you know, you become bar mitzvah. And I discovered that I was doing something very, very minor, uh, that I was doing something not uh, completely correct in my own putting on of the tefillin. N nothing that prevented the fulfillment of the mitzvah, but it wasn't exactly the proper minhag about... Uh, the, the, the precise way of, of, of tying the, the ritzua around the, around the center finger uh, that I, I didn't get it exactly, I hadn't been doing it exactly right, and I couldn't remember whether I had been taught wrong oh so many years ago, or at some point I just started doing it by rote in a wrong way, and I hadn't thought about it, and I hadn't, you know, and just the act of learning, you know, increases the proper normative the proper normative behavior, but action alone does not always flow in the other direction. You can put tefillin on every day, 
but it doesn't necessarily work backwards that that causes you to study the laws in a more precise manner. But study does lead to action, and that is the priority of halachic man. However, even the norm is at the outset ideal, not real. Even the halacha at its onset is the theoretical. It's not as it's put into practice. At its heart, halacha is a theoretical body, which then takes on a real-world application. Halachic man is not particularly concerned about the possibility of actualizing the norm in the concrete world. He wishes to mint an ideal, a kind of platonic normative coin. Even those laws that are not practiced in the present time are subjected to this normative viewpoint. That's, by the way, um, uh, this is something that's, that's quite, uh, quite uh, characteristic of brisker lumbus of the study of Torah as popularized by Rabbi Salavichuk's uh, grandfather, that all realms of Torah study were brought into the fore. It, it, classically, in Yeshivot, there were certain Masechtot that were studied. And there were certain Masechtot that were, shall we say, neglected. And the Masechtot, the Talmudic tractates that were not given always fair treatment were particularly the ones like Zvachim, Menachos, that, uh, that um, in, in Kodshim, Taros, the sections of the Talmud, the sections of the Lacha that are not currently applicable because of the absence of the Beit HaMikdash, things related to Korbanot, things related to ritual purity, things that are things that are not practical in the same way that Shabbat and Psachim and, and uh, Brachot are. But Brisk said, no, everything is Torah. And we're going to learn everything, even though it may not today, right now, be applicable because we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. Um, uh, uh, so uh, so uh, that became attention. And by the way, uh, it, it, it harkens back to the Rambam. And it also helps explain part of the reason that Brisk had this particular uh, penchant for the study of the Rambam as a primary text. Uh, because the Rambam as well in the Mishnah Torah is an encyclopedia of halacha, and you almost can enter it and forget that there are so many realms of halacha that are not currently applicable because of our exile existence. Um, and the Rambam kind of deliberately creates this illusion that we're talking about an ideal world where all of the 613 mitzvot are applicable. And from time to time, he'll kind of speak to us in parentheses, as it were, to remind us that that's not the case. But the Pardon me for bringing, you know, kind of the uh, the lingo of of literary studies to the study of a legal text, the Rambam. But the narrative voice of the Mishnah Torah is one that's speaking to people who are living in a time where all 613 mitzvot are the norm, and you're almost unaware of the fact that that's that that's not the case, except from these occasional incursions on the part of the Again, part of the expression, the narrator, to remind us that that's that that's not the case. Um, uh, here we're at the top of page. Well, the bottom six of the even those laws that are not practiced in the present time are subjected to his normative viewpoint. This, despite the fact that he's unable nowadays to fulfill these particular commandments. The maxim of the sages, greatest study of the leads to action, has a twofold meaning. One, action may mean determining the halakha or ideal norm. And two, action may refer to implementing the ideal norm in the real world. So number two is what we generally think of as halakha le ma'ase. Ma'ase, action, means what do we do? How much matzah do you need to eat? That's the halachala ma'aseh question. 
and we have to study the sugyot in order to determine an answer. Now, we often think that to determine an answer means you either ask the rabbi or you look in one of these little handbooks. Right? And all of these questions are determined. There's like a handbook that tells you. You can even buy these little charts that show you, like, you know, lay down your matzah between these dotted lines, and that's how much matzah you should eat. That's not what Rabbi Soloveitchik is talking about here. He's talking about the kind of limud, the kind of halachic analysis that helps us get at an understanding of the bottom line halacha. That's halacha lamase, as we generally understand it. When we say that greatest study for study leads to action, well, if you want to know what the halacha is, you have to study. If you want to keep Shabbat, so you have to learn Hilchot Shabbat. That's halacha lamaseh. But action doesn't always mean actually implementing, fulfilling the mitzvah in practice. Action may mean determining the halacha or the ideal norm, which we might not be able to carry out at the moment because there's this whole realm of the 613 mitzvot which are not practiced today. But when you're learning, that doesn't matter. We can learn under a kind of historical uh, amnesia that allows us to be engaged in the study so that we're learning one sugya about, uh, I don't know, Mesechet Yoma. On one page, you might be learning a sugya that's talking about a sick person who, God forbid, has to eat on Yom Kippur and how that might be done. That's a practical question that probably comes up all over the place every year. How a person can eat on Yom Kippur if they're forced to eat on Yom Kippur? Under what conditions? Who's considered a sick person that should be allowed or even forced to eat on Yom Kippur? But a few pages earlier, a few pages later, there's going to be a discussion about the special Avorat Yom Kippurim in the Beit HaMikdash and what the Kohen Gadol would do uh, and how the service was conducted on Yom Kippur in the Beit HaMikdash. And the learner, when halachic man sits down with Masechet Yoma, it doesn't matter which page he's opened up to. In both cases, the first one, which is very practical, like if you are a rabbi, if you are a rabbi, you better know those halachot. Because you can bet, if not this Yom Kippur, then next Yom Kippur, one of your congregants is going to come to you on Yom Kippur morning and he's going to ask you this question. And you better have the answer. Well, this is not like a question about Yala Vyavo on Rosh Chodesh. It's a question. The person has a question. You are their only source of information. It's Yom Kippur. You can't call a greater, more holy, more knowledgeable, more smart rabbi. You're there, you're on your own, and you either know the answer or you don't know the answer. And that's the garden variety understanding and nature and brand of halakha lama'aseh. But then there's halakha lama'aseh. How did the Kohen Gadol do this on Yom Kippur? Unfortunately, last Yom Kippur at least, no one needed the answer to that question. They may have been curious. They may have wanted to know. But it, it was, sadly, only a theoretical question. Maybe next Yom Kippur it will be different. But it's no less a halakha lama'aseh question. It's no less a question of action. Because you have to determine the halakha even if it's merely an ideal or, an, for today, an abstract norm. But when you're learning, it doesn't matter. You should, you should approach them both as if they were pressing matters of urgency even though one is merely, merely theoretical and the other is eminently practical. Let me, uh, Ari, I'm going to come back to your comment in a second. Halachic man stresses action 
action in the first meaning, in the abstract meaning. However, cognition itself is directed towards the ethos, not towards the logos. These are, these are terms, I mean, these are philosophical terms which originate in, in Aristotle. Aristotle has a work called On Rhetoric. And there he defines ethos. Ethos means what we would call, I mean, it's related to the notion of authority, but it's what we would call character. And logos is, is logic. From this perspective, therefore, halachic man resembles homo religiosus, not cognitive man. For while cognitive man is not norm-oriented, cognitive man looks at the, at, the, at the cosmos to understand the motion of heavenly bodies, not to figure out what kind of obligation that places on, on, on me not to figure out how this affects our mode of keeping religious time, not to figure out on what day do I have to eat the matzah, next Wednesday or next Thursday, which, which are the things that halachic man will be looking at. Cognitive man is not norm-oriented. He is not out to discover the hidden imperative in every brook and stone. Homo religiosus, here's the echo of the norm forthcoming from the aspect of creation. Hashemayim misaprim kvodel. In the words of Talim. Right? Homo religiosus is like halachic man. Halachic man is like homo religiosus in this way, in that sense that both of them feel this, feel the sense of being mitzuvim, of being commanded, of having mitzvot to do. Let me now look at, at this comment, this learned comment from Aryeh, who's a mathematician, which always means I'm going to have no idea what he's talking about. But Aryeh writes, deal in mathematics, where, for example, we can talk about something in n dimensions despite having no way to really experience it. Right. In other words, in math, in math we have the same notion of a kind of pure abstract. And indeed, for the halakha, it will be again. And for the math, there is nothing so esoteric that it does not one day become useful and necessary. And if there's something beyond even that to know and to delve into a thing itself. Okay. Ari, right, can you give us an example of something that start, started off in mathematics as a mere theoretical and then actually had some kind of application in the realm of science or research or... Okay, the tensor fields. Okay, you'll have to you'll have to give us a little more background on tensor fields for morons or whatever the name of the whatever the name of that uh, that book would be. Um, uh, da, 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 da. But what is the tale of the heavens when we talk about Hashemayim Misapim Kodel? if not the proclamation of the norm. What nature, what the cosmos are trying to communicate to us is the norm, is the halakha, or the mitzvot. Ah, you look at the night sky and you see something very romantic. Not the halakhic man. You look at the bubbling brook. And you see the beauties of nature, not so halachic man. Halachic man looks at it and he sees the norm, the declaration of the commandments. All of existence declares the glory of God, man's obligation to order his life according to the will of the Almighty, the principle of, and thou shalt walk in his ways, halachta bidrachav, flows from the halachic man's normative relationship to the world. We can know God's ways only through studying the cosmos. For it is the cosmos that there, st that there stand revealed before us the glorious and the resplendent attributes of action. And here he quotes the Rambam in the Morinu in part 1, chapter 54. 
We're going to come back to this in greater length momentarily. The cognition of the attributes of action is the source of the ethical life. In order to implement the ethical ideal, we must fix upon the whole of the being and cognize it. This cognition is teleological in essence. It aims to reveal the traces of the norm hidden within reality, or as I said earlier, to reverse engineer. Since we are commanded to be godlike, we have a problem. Because we don't have the same kind of ready, direct access to God that we have to people in our lives. God is mysterious. He is far and distant. He has revealed himself to us in, through two channels through the created world and through the divine word. But we can't actually call him up on the telephone and ask him answers to questions. And we certainly can't always divine his mysterious ways, something that we've all been thinking a lot about the last two days. And he's hidden from our daily sight. And to find him in the created world is kind of hard. Proof being, lots of people look at the created world and don't necessarily see God's revealed handiwork. It's actually quite easy to look at the created world and not see God's revealed handiwork. And everyone in the modern world in the post-Darwinian world, to some degree, either does that automatically or has to kind of resist that tug. Even people who do see God in nature are always hearing the echoes of, of, of Darwin, or at least Darwin's followers, because Darwin himself was a man uh, of of not uncomplicated faith, but of, of faith. But by Darwin, I don't mean Charles. I mean the Darwinian worldview. So it's, it's not automatic that you look at the world and are filled with a sense of being a commanded creature who's tasked to do God's mitzvot. That doesn't happen automatically. So how are we meant to walk in God's ways? How are we meant to fulfill the obligation of to imitate God when he's kind of hidden from us? Well, he's again revealed himself in these different ways, one through revelation, through the Torah, and the halachic system at large, which is an emanation of that, and the other is through the created world. So the Rambam in, in, uh, in the Moran of Uchim, in the Guide for the Perplex, discusses this. Rabbi Soloveitchik discusses this passage at greater length in his work, Uvikashtem Misham. Uvikashtem Misham is a work I've mentioned a few times. It was published in English just a couple of years ago. It's titled, And From There You Shall Seek. Um, Uvikashtem Misham, the title originally was Isha Elohim, the man of God. In many ways, it's a parallel text to Isha Halacha. In some ways, it's a description of homo religiosis, of the religious personality. There's a section here. There's a section here where, I mean, he quotes, I brought it largely because he quotes the Morne uh, at length. Um, here at the bottom of page, uh, I think it's the bottom of page 186. Oh, I see the scan is slightly cut off. Okay. The idea that the creation of the world was a moral act and that man must try to imitate God by devoting himself to acts of creativity, a theme is going to come back to at greater length in the second half of Halach Man, 
is the foundation of Maimonides' theory of the attributes of action. If we want to know how we should act, we have to know something about what God wants of us. If the creation of the world was a moral act, then we should be able to determine something about ethics and morality through the proper study of creation. It is, and again, the Rav is here channeling the Rambam. His own views may differ slightly. It is permitted to use attributes that describe the works of the Creator with which He created the world and continues to govern it, since these are all moral acts, attributes that require man to adapt his actions to them. We know, this is a, one of the Rambam's guiding principles, we know God's attributes. We know his character. We know his something about his character. We know something about 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 his his values by looking at his acts. That, that's what that's what are called his attributes. And presumably, they are meant to serve as models for our own behavior. So that's the very famous Talmudic formula: Mahu Rachum Afatarachum. Just as God is merciful, how do we know God is merciful? Because we know that he acts mercifully. So if his actions are merciful, presumably we are meant to be merciful. Um, if God is kind, we are meant to be kind. If God heals the sick, we are meant to try to alleviate pain and suffering and disease in this, in this world. Um, Maimonides expressed this as follows, and here's the quote from the morning book. I see Arya is filling us in with a learned, a learned discourse on tensor fields, and those that are interested should read these, read these chats. Okay. Know that, the, and here's the quote. Here's the quote from the morning book in the back of the text. Know that the master of those who know, that is, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, made two requests and received an answer to both of them. One request consisted in his asking God, may be exalted, to let him, Moshe, know his essence and true reality. Parshat Kitisa, Vareni Naid Kvodecha. Moshe asks to understand something about the, the true essence of God, to get a vision of, of God in a way theretofore unobtained. The second request, which he put first, was that he let him know his attributes. His request regarding knowledge of God's attributes is conveyed as a saying, show me your ways that I may know you. Then he asks for the apprehension of his essence, may be exalted. This is what he means when he says, show me, I pray, your glory. Whereupon he receives a favorable answer with regard to what he had asked for first. Show me your ways. For he was told, I will make all my goodness pass before you. This is the, the image of, God, of Moshe pleading with God after the Chet Egel, the sin of the calf, the golden calf. And he says, look, God, show me your ways. Show me who you really are. And God somehow communicates his attributes. These are the, these are the Yud Gimel Mido that we use in the Slichot on Yom Kippur and during a certain Tshuva, Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum, Vachanun, Erech, Apayim, Rav Chesed, Ve'emet, etc. God, Moshe wants to know about God. So God kind of gives him his calling card. And the calling card are God's modes of action, of how he acts. And they are all ethical categories kind and truth and long-suffering and etc. 
But when it comes to knowing God himself, so that can't be done. This notion is indicated when it says, He is trusted in all my house, that Moshe is ne'eman b'chol beti. That is, he has grasped the existence of all my world with a true and firmly established understanding. Scripture restricts itself to mentioning only the 13 characteristics, the Shloshah Sir Midot. Although Moshe apprehended all his goodness, I mean to say, his actions. So the Rambam goes on to say that action is ethics. Ethics is action. You want to know what ethical behavior is, you can look at how God acts. And from that, you can determine what proper behavior is. So for, for the Rambam, looking at the world is itself an ethical uh, experiment. You're meant to be able to understand something about God. And what are the only things we're able to understand about God since we can never truly understand God himself? We're able to understand God's act, action. And by understanding his action, we are meant to be able, again, doesn't happen automatically, we are meant to be able to intuit or to draw guidance on how we should act. That's what the Rambam says. The Rav does not fully subscribe to this. The Rav does not fully subscribe to this. Because the Rav seems to think that that um, that looking at at the created world, looking at nature, can only we can only draw out the lesson by looking at nature through the glasses of the halachic man, through that kind of superimposed blueprint that we've been talking about until now. So that studying halacha, again with a capital H, is something you can do by looking in a book, by looking in a Gemara, or by looking at a brook, a bubbling brook, or a mountain, or the stars. Because looking at the stars is another way of looking at Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Looking at a mountainside is another way of looking at Masechet Eruvin. Looking at a palm tree is another way of looking at Masechet Sukkah. So that for the Rav, for the Halachic man at least, for the Halachic man at least, the, the examination of nature is another way to get at the Halachic the halachic knowledge. The Rav goes back and says, however, while Homer religiosus accepts the norm against his will, as though a demon compelled him, halachic man does not experience any consciousness of compulsion accompanying the norm. Rather, it seems to him as though he discovered the norm in his innermost self, as though it was just a commandment that had been imposed. Not, not just the commandment that had been imposed upon him, but an existential law of his very being. Halachic man does not struggle with his evil impulses, nor does he clash with the temper, tempter, the tempter who seeks to deprive him of his senses. Halachic men are not subject to the whispered proffer of desire, and they need not exert themselves to resist its pull. Again, going back to that old model of what homo religiosus, as opposed, in some ways, again, halachic man is like homo religiosus. Both of them look at the created world and draw from it a sense of obligation, which is not what cognitive man does. But homo religiosus differs from halachic man because homo religiosus feels a tension 
by being part of the created world. Because part of the definition of being in the created world, of being of the created world, is the example I've given countless times, you need to eat lunch. And lunch can be spiritually distracting. And not only that, you have some other biological needs and drives and desires that are more powerful than having a salami sandwich. And they can be tempting. And that's why the Rav here introduces the, the, the tempter and the eighth Sahara. Halachic man is not troubled by these things. Because halachic man doesn't think that human desires are inherently wrong or polluting or evil. They need, again, uh, he's repeating ideas that we discussed before, maybe I'm repeating ideas that I've discussed before, uh, those desires and drives need to be channeled, they need to be tamed. That is part of the halachic enterprise. But they're not inherently evil. Halachic man is firmly embedded in this world and does not suffer from the pangs of the dualism of the spiritual and the corporeal, of the soul which ascends on high and the body which descends below. That's the problem of Homer Legiosis. Unlike the Christian saints whose lives consisted of a long series of battles with the dazzling allure of life, carnal, this worldly pleasures, uh, the, the famous uh, line that's often ascribed to Augustine, St. Augustine, uh, you know, God make me chaste, but just not yet. Right? And the desire that we should be able to overcome our desires, but you know, tomorrow, let us live it up, let us live it up today. That's not halachic man. Uh, the great Jewish scholars know nothing about man's conflict with the evil urge. Now, of course, plenty of Jewish scholars did spend a lot of time thinking and writing about this. So when he's talking about uh, great Jewish scholars, he's talking about people that are ensconced with two feet within the worldview of halachic man. There are plenty of great Jewish scholars who, who are not. So th this is not a contradiction. The church fathers devoted themselves to religious life in a state of compulsion and duress. The Jewish sages in a state of joy and freedom. Thus King David who said, day to day, yom 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 day to day pours forth speech and night to night pronounces knowledge, goes on in the great eightfold alphabetical psalm of law. This is Tehillim Kufyu Tet, chapter 119 in Tehillim, is this long multiple acrostic where, uh, you know, the first eight verses start with the letter Aleph and the next eight with the, with the Od Bet, etc. It's the very long, it's the longest chapter in, in Tanakh. Uh, I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. This is my comfort and my affliction with the world that the word has, has quickened me. That, that, that the Torah itself is pleasure. The Torah itself is, is, is joyful. Right? Religion is not oppressive. It doesn't mean, again, this might seem to be a contradiction to what we mentioned earlier, uh, and maybe it's something of a paradox here, uh, at least viewed from one perspective. Remember, the Rev went to great lengths to describe that religion is not a paradise, it's a paradox. It doesn't give you all the answers. It gives you questions that challenge you. Yes, but the religious life is one of joy, meaning there's no contradiction between his overall larger existential uh, orientation and the fact that being commanded is the experience of a joyful life. We do not here have a directive that imposes upon man obligations against which he rebels, but delightful commandments which his soul passionately desires. When halakhic man comes to the real world, he's already created his ideal, which shines with the radiance of the north. The real world does not impose upon him anything new, nor does it compel him to perform any new action of which he has not been aware beforehand in this ideal world. It's not, it's not a sense of, of compulsion. 
he is free to create it. Spiritual freedom and intellectual independence reign there in unlimited fashion. Consequently, it seems to him as though this ideal world, it seems to him as though this ideal world is his own creation. Therefore, he is free and independent in his normative understanding. Ein ben chorin elami shosek ba Torah. There is no free man except for one who studies the Torah. That's a that's a, a very well known Mishnah in Avot. But the idea is that what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be a ben chorin? What does it mean to be the opposite of of a slave? So someone who's who's a suk ba Torah. Ah, the Torah puts all these obligations on you, and it puts all these restrictions on you. Right? It's the opposite of being free. No, it's liberating. He who occupies himself with the Torah and gleans new creative insights from it, indeed, is a free and independent, independent man. So let me look at some of these chats. Ah, okay. Uh, Aria, uh, Aria just sent us a link to his math blog, where he's putting up some of these comments. Let me just read for everyone. It's the the website is uh, why I met w h y i m a t h y i math dot blogspot dot com. People can catch there for the parallels to what we talked about in uh, in um, in this evening's discussion. Why I math? The world through the most wondrous lens, mathematics. Also poetry. Hmm? Okay, so we're going to have to take a more careful look at this. We will end it here uh, for now, and we will go on to chapter eleven next time, uh, which is a further a further examination of because he keeps doing this. He keeps he keeps uh, these comparisons in some ways. Halachic man is like cognitive man. In other ways, he's like homo religiosus. In some ways, he's the exact opposite of cognitive man. In some ways, he's the exact opposite of, of homo religiosus. These these kinds of comparisons and contrasts. So the this opposition, the way in which halachic man and 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 religious man are different, uh, it becomes the topic of the next chapter. Uh, good evening. We will continue next week.